I'm thrilled tonight to introduce two people. Um, Michael Barrett on my right is the musical director for this evening's concert. Um, he's the co-founder and associate artistic director of the New York Festival of Song and co-founder and music director of the Moab Music Festival in Utah. Michael has been a guest conductor with the Orchestra of St. Luke's, the New York Philharmonic, the London Symphony, the Israeli Philharmonic, and others. Michael was protege of Bernstein, a protege of Bernstein's beginning as a student in 1982. He served as Maestro Bernstein's assistant conductor from 1985 to 1990. He currently serves as music advisor to the Leonard Bernstein estate, but most importantly, today is his birthday. <laughs> And tomorrow his daughter is graduating from college. Um, so that's, that's, the big thing. that's the big thing. That's the big thing. Oh, and I didn't introduce myself. My name is Mark Horowitz with the library, and I'm the curator of the Bernstein Collection here and have been doing so for 25 years. So he's in my blood now, I think you'll say. And our surprise guest this evening to my right right. The Horner Inner. Yeah, is Jamie Bernstein, <laughs> Leonard's oldest daughter, the firstborn child, the keeper of the flame. Um, Jamie is an author, narrator, and filmmaker. Her memoir, which literally is hot off the press, Famous Father Girl, a memoir of growing up Bernstein, is literally just off the press. I think it doesn't come out on Amazon until June 5th. June 12th. Yeah, you can pre-order it, but it, it'll yeah. be in the shelves of the bookstores yeah. on June 12th. So and I've read it already. It's, it's fantastic. Thanks. Um, in addition to the Bernstein Beat, a family concert about her father modeled after his own groundbreaking young people's concerts. Jamie has written and narrated concerts for audiences of all ages, Mozart, Copeland, Stravinsky, and others. As a concert narrator, she's appeared everywhere from Beijing to London to Vancouver. Um, and in addition to her own scripted narrations, Jamie, perf Jamie performs standard concert narrations such as Walton's Facade and Copeland's A Lincoln Portrait. As a broadcaster, Jamie has produced and hosted shows for radio stations in the U.S. and U.K. She has presented the New York Philharmonic's live national radio broadcasts as well as live broadcasts from Tanglewood. Jamie is co-director of the documentary Crescendo, The Power of Music. So now you know who's here. So <laughs> Any questions so far? But um, what, what have you done lately? <laughs> yeah. Well, both of you lately, I, I think, have been doing a lot of Bernstein-related work and traveling. I guess I'm just curious, has what's been unexpected this year? Have Did you feel prepared for everything, or? Well, I, you know, I travel a lot doing concert narrations and giving talks and all the various things that I do, but really, the past, 15 years were like the training for the marathon of this year because we, you know, we, the Bernstein office and my brother and sister and I and Michael, and we all worked really hard to remind the world that the centennial of Leonard Bernstein was coming and, and we suggested all sorts of things they might do. And then we just left everybody to figure it out. And to our astonishment, the, re the response has been tremendous. And on the database at the Bernstein office, we are now well past 3,300 centennial-related events worldwide. And no, I will not be able to attend them all. <laughs> but I sure But I'm you're trying. coming close. I'm trying. I'm trying. <laughs> I'm somewhere well, else. We're special. Though. So Jamie is here tonight. I th is it tomorrow or is it the 20th? On the 20th here in Washington, in two days, you have two events, right? You have to be at the Phillips and at the oh, right. Kennedy Center. Yeah, it's there's like this. a wonderful concert called Late Night with Leonard Bernstein, which I narrate. And uh, it's two pianists, Michael Boriskin and John Musto, and a wonderful soprano, Amy Burton. And then it purports to be a sort of guided tour inside my father's insomniac brain. And so this is at the Phillips. It's at the Phillips in the afternoon, and then I have to go straight from there to the Washington National Opera's gala to give a little, uh, say a few words. And, and they're doing a big Bernstein show that they night have too, a, aren't they? They have some big Bernstein show, but then mm. I'm actually dashing off to the other side of the building because I want to catch Wynton Marsalis doing his Bernstein show. And you can't squeeze in Candide, which is playing right now at the opera, too? I was going to, but I think I have a rehearsal. <laughs> yes. 
But no matter how many things I do, I'm always missing something terrific. I, I was surprised at the response that um, uh, all over the world of this groundswell of people who got really, really interested in Leonard Bernstein, not just to do a concert, but um, I was in Omaha. They had this whole Bernstein and Mahler festival in Omaha, and they're playing like 30 of his pieces throughout the whole season, uh, a lot of it in the context of Gustav Mahler's work as well. So people are finding their own way in their own community or their own school or their own youth orchestra or their own major opera house, you know, to celebrate Bernstein. And it's been, it's, it's been great, but it's also been, uh, I think I was a little bit surprised, but when I think about it, I'm not really surprised because his music, uh, I knew the quality of his music always, and uh, he had this kind of bad rap on him, uh, especially in the 60s and 70s, and it wasn't until really the late 80s it just started to ease up just a little bit, and that was because he wrote mostly tonal music. He wrote tunes, you know, melodies. Good ones. Yeah, good ones, and even in his serious music, it was, he wrote a lot of listenable music. I mean, he wrote some very gnarly pieces, too. Um, you'll hear the first thing on tonight's program is pretty out, <laughs> if I can put it that way. Pretty pointy. <laughs> pointy. That's yeah. my sister's adjective. Um, but uh, the, the musical establishment and the halls of academia were really down on him. You know he never won a Pulitzer Prize? You know? I mean, West Side Story didn't even win the Tony Award. He used to say, yeah, I lost out to 76 trombones. Um, I, I thought what we'd do tonight is something a little more, not serious, but because people here are going, I pr I'm presuming everybody's going to the concert right after this, I thought we'd take the opportunity to have the two of you here to get a little more in depth about a couple of the things that are going to be performed tonight. Um, and one of them is stuff from A Quiet Place. Um, so I thought people here would sort of enjoy some backstage stuff about that. Um, Who knows what A Quiet Place is? Wow. <laughs> Two, three, four. Pretty good. So you're fans. It was performed here at the Kennedy Center in 1984? Three, four, five? Can't yes, remember. in 84. Okay. But it has had pr precious few productions uh, anywhere, really, but it, it was done in uh, here in Houston, and recently a n New York City opera put it on, a fine production in New York City. And it was just in Philadelphia. That was not, that yeah, that was a, a s smaller version of it. And right, yeah. At Curtis Institute. Right, right. Uh, one thing I was cur curious about, Jamie, and I've never sort of read anywhere or known, the for those who don't know, the part of a Quiet Place is Lenny's early opera called Trouble in Tahiti, um, which at one point when the show was in Houston sort of opened the show, the, the opera, and in three acts, and it was the first act, but then they decided that didn't work, and you guys can sort of tell me why, but then at the Kennedy Center, it was moved as a flashback to the second act. Right, it comes in the middle now. Uh, so Trouble in Tahiti was this chamber opera, like a 45-minute-ish, is it, opera? Yeah, 40. Um, that he wrote in 1951. It's a one-act opera. And, and then ever so many decades later, he and his librettist Stephen Wadsworth decided to write a sequel of sorts to Trouble in Tahiti. Um, and that was A Quiet Place. So it opened at Houston Opera, Trouble in Tahiti came first, and it was in this very sort of uh, user-friendly, jazzy uh, idiom, musical idiom. Whereas A Quiet Place uh, has a very different musical flavor. It's a little more pointy, <laughs> to use Nina's word. It, it, has, it has some, uh, it's thorny, and the opening scene, which takes place in a funeral uh, parlor, at a funeral, is... Uh, Practically all twelve. It's tone, strict, right? strict twelve tone music. Yeah, it Schoenberg would have been, would have given him an A on that. I think. Uh, right. 
So I think that. Or an A flat or an A plus or any right. other. Sorry. Yes, Sorry. an A flat. Oh, <laughs> very good. Anyway, it was, uh, it was troublesome to start with trouble in Tahiti and then have your ear be used to that and then uh, suddenly confront this completely different musical language. But if you start, if you start in the funeral parlor and you hear 38 minutes of 12-tone music, when you hear trouble in Tahiti, oh, it's a relief. Yeah, so yeah. That, that seemed to work better. So now it was inserted in the middle as a flashback. And then you go back into the you know, present time and, and then the opera finishes there. But it's the same characters. Um, some of the characters you don't even meet in Trouble in Tahiti. There's a little boy named Junior. They, the parents talk about him, but you no never see him. And then in A Quiet Place, there he is, a full-grown man. It's really about probably 20, 25 years later. And, and it's really about the family and how and their dynamics. Which is what Trouble in Tahiti is, too. It's about a failing marriage is really what it's about. Well, so. th that's something that I, I was really interested in, which is, as I understand it, the Trouble in Tahiti was very much influenced by your grandparents' marriage. And in f but it's never been clear to me, did they realize it? Did, how did they respond that's to it? That's a great it? question, and I don't know the answer. Uh, I, I've always wondered what was Sam and Jenny's reaction to this opera about Sam and Dinah. Originally, my father was going to call the married couple Sam and Jenny, and he changed the wife's name to his grandmother's name instead of his mother. I don't know why that made it all somehow more acceptable, but he, he kept the name Sam. He thought he was faking them out, I'm sure. Yeah. I don't know what he was thinking, and I don't know what his parents could have made of it all. I never but did hear what their reaction was. Did, did your grandmother see a, a quiet place? That's a good question, too. Yeah. I don't know if she did. She may not have, um, because it didn't come to Boston, and I don't think she came down to New York for it, and I know she wasn't in Houston, so well, maybe she never it saw wasn't it. In, it. It was down in Washington, not in New York, when it, after Houston. It came to here, to uh, the Kennedy Washington. Center. Well, she, I don't think she came down here either. So she never saw it. Uh, mind you, my father wrote Trouble in Tahiti, this portrait of a marriage on the rocks, on his honeymoon. <laughs> I think in a way it was a sort of like a superstitious spit in the corner thing, like if I write this, then it won't happen to me or something. Well, yeah. actually, that was something. I, I made an editorial decision in your liner notes. You had something about that. But there's a letter from Lenny to Copeland from his honeymoon talking about he's decided to go back to work on the opera. So my sense is he'd at least started it before then. So that's what I put in the But program. he still wrote it on well, his honeymoon. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. Okay. Oh, so did you uh, did you edit my I did. Notes? Oh, I okay. Did. So, so what I said <laughs> and what Mark took out was <laughs> that I thought that he had r written this as a kind of vaccination yeah. against, yeah. just what Jamie said, against his brand new marriage turning out like his exclusive. parents' marriage. You know, yeah. he did not want that to happen. And so anyway. I made it worked on it during his honeymoon. Yeah. So I, I think that was okay. Yeah. okay. Um, and then you took a quiet work with Lenny on a quiet place when you took it to he took it to Vienna and recorded it right and yeah. you, can you talk a little bit about the evolution there you said something to me about there were how many edits that he oh who could count I mean so working with Bernstein was very inter interesting I was his assistant conductor on this project and we had a big American cast it was all in English and it takes place in America so we brought over all these young American singers, and Stephen Wadsworth was directing it for the first time, and he's the guy who wrote the libretto, and he was already an established opera director, very, very talented, still is. And uh, um, so we would go, we would have our rehearsals, orchestra rehearsals, we'd collect all the parts at the end of the rehearsal, we'd bring them back to his hotel suite, he had this big, huge room, and I just spread out all of the parts on the floor. And, you know, there they were. So and that's a lot of music, you know. It was a big orchestra. Probably had, I don't know, 60 parts. Because some of, some of the players share parts. So two, two violins read the same part. So it's probably an orchestra of 80, and we probably had 60 parts there. So um, 
we would have a list of what I would be taking notes on all day, and he'd go, oh, this is, fix that, and oh, this isn't right, and that should be a piano, not a mezzo piano, and you know, just markings, and then this chord isn't right, we have to find that. We'd still, fi we're finding note mistakes from copyists and things like that, so we'd have this big long list, and we'd go through, I'd, and I'd do them one by one, and he'd say, he'd call them out, you know, and I'd be running around and with, a, with a, an eraser and a pen or a pencil, and just making sure that the parts were marked clearly. It might be a new phrase marking, it might be a, a dynamic because the balance wasn't right with the singers. So we had to, you know, put in a lot of piano, pianissimos, you know, bring, bring the orchestra down. Things like that just help a conductor so you don't have to stop all the time and tell your players what you want. Even though you're showing them with your hands and your, your body, they, it hel it's reinforcing if it's in the music, so. And he was a stickler for that. He always marked his parts very, very clearly. Yeah, it, I, I sort of more of a musical theater guy, and that's my area of expertise. And in my experience, a lot of musicals, when they're being written, a lot of thought is being put into who the performers are going to be, and things often tend to be written for somebody's voice or something like that. And with the stuff in the collection with West Side Story, there's a lot of letters from your father to your mother complaining that they're forcing him to make changes and cuts, and you know they're taking Tony's high C away from him and stuff like that. But do, do you have a sense with A Quiet Place, did, was, was everything set in his mind or did thi were things affected or influenced by the performers themselves and who was cast? Did he write any of the pieces for specific performers? I'd, I don't think in A Quiet Place because the casts were changing all the time. Um, and like I said, they're cast with young Americans, you know, a lot of 20 and 30 somethings. You know, there was young Kurt Ullman and Peter Cazares and John Brandstetter, people like that. Wendy White, oh yeah, I remember all these people, but Sherry Greenwald, Sherry Greenwald yeah. A um, lot of beautiful singers, but you know, Americans are so versatile, and even more so now in terms of their musical training and in terms of our musical culture in America is so broad. And young people now, they this cast you're gonna hear tonight, I, I could, put them in practically any kind of music and in three or four days they would just knock it out of the park. They, they just, they know how to do practically anything stylistically, you know. You just have to get them going and then they, they start to, to get it. You'll, you'll he hear them sing in five or six different kinds of musical styles tonight, from real opera to pop tunes, you know, and, and jazz and uh, blues and stuff like that, so. Um, the few singers I can think of that Lenny really had in his mind though were Jenny Terrell, who was at the beginning of his career and who premiered uh, most of his early compositions like the Jeremiah Symphony and I Hate Music. And she was one of the great sopranos from in the 1940s and 50s and 60s, American. And he even wrote in his last piece, Arias and Barker Rolls. There's a, an F sharp that the singer has to kind of float a certain way, it's supposed to be soft and gentle. And he just writes over this one note, Jenny Terrell. <laughs> <laughs> like, do it like that. <laughs> uh, the other one he really loved toward the end of his career was uh, Krista Ludwig, of course. And, and But he worked with so many great singers. And early in his career, he got to work with Maria Callas. But they never recorded because he said, well, we had different recording companies and they wouldn't let us. That's a loss. Yeah. That is. Um, also on the program tonight are several things from 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, which was something of a tra tragic situation. <laughs> um, and I'm curious, you were there, Jamie, and I just, do you, do you remember what it was like out of town backstage, the rewriting, changing, your, do you uh, want to remember? <laughs> well, I, I, truly, I have blocked out <laughs> most of my memories. Uh, the, what little I remembered, I put in my book. But uh, the well, it was ju just to recap. Uh, this was a Broadway show that my father collaborated on with Alan J. Lerner, who wrote Camelot and My Fair Lady, and everyone was so sure that 
this musical was a slam dunk that the Coca-Cola company invested a million dollars <laughs> in this show and, and no corporation had ever done that before back. This was in 1976 and it was supposed to be about the White House. It was called 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue and um, coming out in the bicentennial and so like how could you lose? It just sounded like the slam dunk of all time. But what my father and Alan Jay were trying to do, this was just after Watergate, and everyone was so uh, traumatized by what we had all been through, and there was this sense that, that we had narrowly escaped losing our grasp of our democracy. And so my father and Alan Jay Lerner really wanted to present a work that would express their, that very sensibility. And, and so they devised this metaphor that the White House was the metaphor for the democracy and it was a, a kind of history of the White House and the United States, or at least the first 100 years, as seen through the successive presidents and their wives and this African-American family uh, of servants who lived downstairs. It was like upstairs, downstairs in the White House. And then you would follow the family in successive generations along with the successive presidents and their wives upstairs, which meant there wasn't really a plot and there weren't characters that you could follow along because it was more like a pageant where, you know, they- Here comes this change. president, yeah, right. Yeah. Here's so President like, Jefferson and he does know, this- After yeah. about president number six or seven, you know, you're sitting in the audience and you're feeling like, um, so you mean like I'm stuck here until how, how many presidents more? <laughs> <laughs> so it had a kind of built-in structural problem that they never succeeded in resolving. And they went through all kinds of incarnations, which I will not uh, get into, but it was really uh, a problem. And so when it finally came to New York City and opened on Broadway, it closed in six days. There were like eight performances and boom, it was, and no recording. And no cast recording because the, you know, Bernstein and Lerner were so shattered by the experience that they just said, you know, forget it, just, it's gone. We're closing the lid and we're walking away. And that's what happened. So a lot of this music was lost to the world. My father repurposed some of it into this and that. And uh, there are a couple of songs from that show that still have a life. and. Uh, one of them that still really resonates more than ever today is the song Take Care of This House. Is that in the show tonight? Yeah, we're, we're doing it tonight. Why I think don't you talk about that? We're doing five or six um, things from uh, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue tonight. Because the library, you guys, uh, requested it. And yeah. I thought, well, why not? There's a lot of fine music here. A lot. The music is Fabulous. The and score is amazing. And it's some great book. lyrics, too, actually. There's some yeah, the really lyrics clever lyrics are fantastic, things. yeah. But, you know, I thought also this was a show that tried to really tackle a lot of race issues, black and white, black America, you know, and it went from slavery to post-slavery and, and all of these issues, and there were some really tricky things in this show which are, will not be on tonight's program, <laughs> but at the heart of it, and this is what I came to realize, I think, from looking at it this time, I thought, oh, I, I, saw, I can see what this show should have been. It, the focus, because everything, everything that's shown to you about the, uh, the black family, the servants at the White House, is kind of through the lens of of the first ladies and the presidents, you know. Or early on, there's even a, an incredibly brilliant scene of British Admiralty occupying the White House when the British uh, actually burned the White House, partially anyway, except it started to rain. They must have done it in May. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, but it occurred to me at the heart of the show is a young boy named Lud, L-U-D, and uh, his young playmate, whose name is Thomasina, Sina, he calls her. And Lud and Sina grow up together, and you're gonna hear a lot of their music 
tonight, um, two or three things anyway, and they, I thought, oh, here are the real people. These are the, this is the humanity of this show, and it should have been a, their love story and their life story as America passes by around them and, and how their status changed or got better or worse or something, I don't know. But that was, uh, I think that's kind of the heart of the, the show now for me. But of course, what Jamie said is true. It's every president has a big thing. And I think it ends with Lincoln about, um, I think he may be the last president, and he doesn't actually appear. Actually Just the hat comes in, I think. <laughs> yeah, that's the shadow. Yeah. 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 Weird. What you told me earlier about take care of this house you just want to sh sh the Lenny's manuscripts? What Did about the what manuscripts? No. Oh, you were just asking me to comment on that song. No, 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 no. Um, you told me when. You oh, that the yes. yeah. So that <laughs> there's a song called "Take Care of This House," which you will hear tonight, and it's Abigail Adams, the first uh, first lady to occupy the White House, and she. She's talking to her little servant boy, Lud, and educating him. And she tell, says, take care of this house. Keep it from harm. If bandits break in, sound the alarm. Care for this house. Shine it by hand and keep, keep it, it so, so clean. clean the, the glow can, can be seen, seen all, all over, over the, the land. land. So, it's a, so it, the house is this metaphor for everything good about America. She says, be always on call. I, if someone makes out, um, this house is everyone's dream. If someone makes off with a dream, the dream will be yours. So don't let this happen. Don't let anyone steal your dream, which is embodied by this great symbol of democracy. Right. So she sings it to Ludd, and then Ludd starts singing along with her. And we're kind of kind of taking it to the next level this time. Lud will grow up very quickly in this song and kind of take it over. Oh, good. I have, I have a tenor with a really nice high A, so <laughs> I'm going to give it to him. That's great. <coughs> um, but le I remember I was in Bernstein's studio, and he had this big stack, <laughs> and Mark said today, yeah, I know that, st that, that big stack of A Quiet Place. I've got it in my office or something. Uh, 1600, yeah. So it was this big thing and it was all bound up and it said 1600 Pennsylvania on it and then Lenny wrote on it with a pencil or he put it on a, p a piece of paper on top I can't remember he said take care of this house and he meant all of this music because he was so uh, I think he was kind of shattered that he had put in so much effort and so much work and he knew so much of a lot of this piece was so beautiful and good but it was it was kind of a loss you know he so he the didn't metaphor find a home, yeah. became a metaphor. Yeah, yeah. sort of. And we're now the library, the ones taking care of the house. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, thank you for letting <laughs> us do that. Yeah, yeah. Really. I didn't mean <laughs> it for it to be an applause line. Yeah, that was an exit line. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> but remember that I, I have something to tell you So that has to do with your taking care of that particular house. So when you're ready, we'll do that. But well, maybe you have more things to discuss for um, us to discuss. It's up to you. Do you want to, whatever it is now, or is it better well, to wait? Well, you have something more that, that you want us to talk about, uh, uh, specifically regarding the concert, or any other pieces, because we could do that first, but I want to make sure to leave room for uh, this surprise well, I Well, I, I had a couple of questions, not about so much about what's on the concert, um, one of which, um, I, this is pr perhaps unfair, but I'm curious if, Either of you have a sense of how different your lives would be today if Lenny had been a doctor or an architect or a <laughs> lawyer? You know, how much that's affected the course of your lives? Uh, well, I, it's imponderable. I mean, my life was so affected in so many ways by how and who my father was, he, you know, that I can't even imagine an alternative. It, it, I can't even picture it, you know. I don't think any of us can with our parents, really. You know, your parents are who they are. And when you're really little, you have no perspective about it. Your family is your family, and your parents are your parents, and you're, you just, it's, it's what you are 
what you wake up into, and you have no frame of reference. And so for me, you know, my, my dad was just my dad for a long time before I figured out that he meant something uh, enormous to other people. You know. Did you want to say something, Michael? Uh, well, I don't think I would have become a, a dental assistant or <laughs> something like that. <laughs> but oh, you would I have been <laughs> such a good one. <laughs> I would just comment on uh, Bernstein's level of of the way he worked, and the, one of the great things he taught me um, that I don't think I would have maybe learned at the same level, being someone else's assistant, let's say, or having a different mentor. And uh, that was, I, I just got this extremely clear vision of what it meant to be a, an artist, but not just an artisan, but a real artist and a really, really good one. And um, it was this kind of uh, relentlessness that he had and this also this thing about not holding his own work sacrosanct. And even I would say, I would e think he even applied that to Beethoven and Mahler. I saw him change some things in Mahler <laughs> several times. And I saw him, and he conducted Mahler's version of Beethoven's string quartets with an entire string orchestra, and with Mahler's markings. And then he said, "Look, I got Mahler's score from the library," and and they're marked in pencil with by Gustav. And um, but it was the he didn't treat his own music that way either. He would o he was always prepared to find something better uh, in his own music, even if it's something that had been played everywhere for the 20 or 30 years. Uh, I remember he did, it, did that with Chichester Psalms the last time he did it that I was around in 1989. And he went, oh, I, I found something. Oh, this is, this is what I always meant. This is how it's supposed to go. And he said, mark that down and write that. And this is uh, the exact tempo marking. Of course, it's different every day and uh, <laughs> how you feel. But he was, he was crazy about really fine-tuning fine his music and and getting closer to what he thought the truth of it was. Um. Both of you have heard so much of Lenny's music through your lives. Do you hear new things in it, in, in different performances? Do you find moments that you hadn't realized before? Do you? Yeah, I do all the time. Really? And in fact, last weekend, I even discovered a whole piece I didn't know. And I really thought I, I had it all in my head, but I did not know The Lark, oh, right. which is this uh, incidental music that he wrote for a, a play by Jean Anouy about Joan of Arc that came out in the early 1950s. And I had really never heard this music, and it's, it's the way I heard it done was with a cappella chorus, is that always how it is? Right, uh, yeah. And in, in it's sometimes it's in French and sometimes in Latin, and it's got this completely medieval sort of folk French dance flavor that mm. is so unlike anything else <laughs> my father ever wrote. And I was just astonished and delighted. It was like a big discovery, like where have I been all these years? I, I missed this wonderful piece. I don't think it's performed very often. It was beautiful. Uh, how much do you know the Dibbuk? Because they're just doing it now, I think. At I just City heard Bell. the Dibbuk too, uh, it, which was a, a ballet that he wrote with Jerry Robbins in the 70s. And they big, huge piece, right? Big piece. And they just did it at the City Ballet last week. I heard that one too last week. So every week it's something else, I uh, must say. I just, w in terms of the Dibbuk, um, in processing your father's papers and his music manuscripts, looking at his sketches, it, it, it almost like it's fire coming out of him, you know, I mean, you can just tell the energy. But the f most fascinating sketches I saw were for the Dybbuk because he's clearly trying to use the Kabbalah That's and right. to sort of form and numerology things. And, you, and everything, you know, right? So there's all these things I've never seen in any of other of his manuscripts. I, I wish somebody would write a dissertation on it. So if there's anybody yeah, here anybody looking there? for a <laughs> dissertation <laughs> topic. Um, so I will now let you do whatever oh. it is you want to do, and then we'll take some questions. And okay, then we'll great. Get to this will just take a, a, a minute or two. So first of all, there are no words to describe the gratitude that my, not just my family feels, but um, musicians like Michael and, and so many others feel about 
what Mark does with, with uh, the Bernstein archives, it's a marvel. And I'm so glad that we decided to bring that gigantic archive here to the Library of Congress because it cannot possibly have been taken care of more beautifully and thoughtfully and creatively. So Thank thanks a lot. And uh, for my book, there's just no way I could have gotten myself through writing this book without the help of Mark and everyone at the library. So anyway, last two weeks ago, Mark and I found ourselves in Baltimore with Marin Alsop and the Baltimore Symphony where we participated in this concert that was moderated by Scott Simon of NPR, right? Yes. And we had a great time talking about the Bernstein music and all of that. And uh, I didn't get a chance to go out into uh, the lobby where Mark told me that he had posted um, a letter that I had written to my father when I was very young um, in which apparently I corrected him uh, because uh, he had evident evidently claimed that Baltimore was the capital of Maryland. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so the, the letter that I wrote says, d and, and I called him Renard, and I'm not sure what that joke was. Ren it might have um, been racist. Renard the father. Yes, right. Um, and here I said, I miss you so much, I don't know what I'm going to do with myself. You know, uh, and, uh, and then, then, you know, you uh, remember, <laughs> sorry, got to get the glasses out, and it's very faint. But anyway, I just wanted to tell you what I wrote. Uh, do you know what? If you remember, you wrote on the other side of your letter, you wrote the capital of the states you were in. Well, it seems you wrote down the wrong capital for Maryland. You wrote Baltimore, and the real capital is in Annapolis. So, okay. So, uh, Mark, <laughs> I wanted you to know that for a few years now, I have had the letter that my father wrote in which he said the wrong capital of Maryland. You kept it back? I kept it because it's so fantastic. I couldn't bear to hand it over, but I'm going to give it to you now because <laughs> it's the one that talks to that one. So look, it's written on the Georgian Towers Motor Hotel stationery <laughs> in Vancouver. And it says, Dearest Littles, it's written to me and my brother Alexander. Imagine I've been in four state capitals already and given concerts in all of them. The capitals of Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, and South Carolina. Can you remember what they are? Answers on back, upside down. <laughs> right? That's so my dad, like... He was always teaching, teaching, always teaching, right? <laughs> but he was wrong! <laughs> <laughs> so for me, this is just the most delightful thing in the whole wide world. <laughs> so and anyway, um, and then the other thing he does in here, which is so adorable, he writes, also, I've just seen the Flintstones here in my hotel room, and they were marvelous tonight. Did you see them? I hope it was the same one about the crazy jazz and hot lips and Fred singing when the saints go marching in. I thought it was wonderful. And I can't get that tune out of my head. And then he draws a staff and he writes, da da da, da da da, which is the original theme song of the Flintstones before the one with the words, Flintstones meets the Flintstones. There was another one before that. And this is it. So all of this is in this fantastic letter. And now I'm giving it to you, Mark. Okay. Four hundred thousand and one. <laughs> exactly. Well, and the great thing ab about the collection, or one of the things is, I knew you were going. We were going to Baltimore to, and do this display, and I knew you were going to be there. So the trick was to find something that related to you and Baltimore. And bingo. And the Bernstein collection. Anything you want, <laughs> there it is. There it is. So, thank you. Um, you so want. now. I'm going to let you guys ask questions. We have, I don't know, about 15 minutes or so, and take advantage. Yes. Do, uh, they're, they're bringing around uh, a microphone so that you get recorded. He's a good trainer. He yeah. trains us to use the microphone. Um, um, I'm delighted to be sharing this evening with you all. Um, I was in the Young People's Orchestras inspired by your father, 
um, to the extent that when I used to play recitals, I would give a little talk before each piece. Because Good for you. That's what he would do. You know, nowadays, that's what <laughs> all the young musicians do. So you were exactly. ahead of your time. <laughs> but I was curious. I saw in a PBS documentary years ago that he seemed to struggle in transitioning from his more outgoing, conducting world role and c composing, going into the composing space. I wondered if you all could share a little bit about well, that. Well, I, I certainly witnessed that. I think I'm sure you did, too. He, he tried, and I think in more or less in the last decade of his life, to have this dual life where he would conduct for about six months and then come back usually in the fall or the winter and then try and be a composer for six months. And it was really tricky for him because he would be so amped up from all the applause and the adulation and the great reviews and the public life and having so many friends all over the world and getting to see them all and having endless parties and he was quite a social animal and he loved people more than anyone I've ever seen and all kinds of people. So he'd come home and then, you know, the most lonely thing, the only thing more lonely than being a composer is like being a writer, I guess, you've just got to sit yourself down and be alone in a room for hours and hours and hours and hope that you come up with something. It's, <coughs> it was very solitary, and I think it took him a long time to finally find that rhythm of being quiet and being a composer. And a lot of times, I don't think he even found it. It just, he'd want to go out or want to go hang out with his friends or invite people over all the time, and uh, it was tricky. Uh, it's hard to have the, uh, vi the most public life you can imagine, which is fun, not just being uh, a public personality, like you know somebody who's on TV, but something that's. I mean, his life. When you conduct a hundred people, you know, you are right there with them. You're doing something really fabulous together, and active, and positive, and it it's a it's a kind of a good drug, you know. It it has releases a lot of endorphins, I think, and. Uh, it's something you want to keep doing. So to just cut that off is strange and tricky. Do you yeah. think that also had something to do with what I heard was that he couldn't understand why his uh, serious music, serious music, wasn't as popular with the public as his more uh, West Side Story and musicals? Um, I wonder if the two went together somehow. Well. I mean, it, it was really like he had several personalities. First, we could say two, the public persona connecting with others and communicating and being on the road and orchestras and audiences and all that. And then the very private, inwardly turned composer um, who would, you know, have to go deep inside himself to find his own notes and to have, and in order to do that, he would have to kind of flush away all everybody else's notes that he'd been composing for all, I mean conducting, thank you, for all those months. And as he got older, it was harder and harder for him to switch the gears. Um, and then just about the time he'd be getting some momentum going with his composing, oh, time to go back on the road and switch gears again. So it was really a, a kind of maddening life that he had designed for himself. But he really did have those two sides of himself. In terms of his own music, um, it, you know, the whole problem with this so-called serious music thing is, as we were discussing before, you could not be taken seriously as a serious composer uh, if you wrote melodies. So by actively choosing to write melodies, my father consciously, um, you know, uh, disqualified himself from being included in that pantheon and therefore would never get something like a Pulitzer Prize. And, and, and you know, in the halls of musical academe, he was uh, not considered a, a worthy composer. Um, but now, of course, we're very glad that he stuck to his guns and continued writing melodies. And you know, these uh, so-called serious pieces, his symphonic works that were so misunderstood at the time, now they sound completely contemporary, if not prescient, because uh, contemporary composers, you know, feel completely free to 
write in any idiom they choose and to mix them all up together just like my father used to do. So his music seems, seems to have laid the groundwork for today's uh, contemporary composer. I, if right? I can add one thing to that. Um, you don't know this, but when you gave us the collection, we made the decision, which we rarely, rarely do, to keep all the fan mail. Usually yeah. we just you know, take a sample hundred or something like that, but there was something about your father's that we thought it expressed so many varied things over so much time, and it's, it's a huge amount of material. I'm guessing 20,000 letters or something like that. Um, and we happened to stumble upon a letter in the fan mail written by a young student at Harvard, John Adams. <laughs> and that's in your program note tonight, it, so you can read it? this story, yeah. Boy, I didn't realize that. Yeah, I just read it and I went, oh, oh that's cool, because John Adams oh, is a teacher mind. of mine, too. The it'll be in the program note. But, yeah. That's great. But he's, he just heard Chichester Psalms, and he's, he sort of berates Lenny. I don't understand how somebody who's as knowledgeable about as you are can turn their back to the future of music. And what's great is on the back of the letter, Lenny writes his response for Helen Coates to type up, his secretary, and it is the most thoughtful, sweet, caring response and basically says, I can only write what comes from my heart, but he phrases it better than that. Wow. And then a year later in the fan mail, or two years later, there's another letter from John Adams telling Lenny how that letter changed his life. <gasps> So, wow, and it, it opened him up to jazz and all those things. That's fantastic. So, that is yeah. collector's item stuff right there. Yeah, yeah. So, wow. anyway, um, next question. Yeah, sure. Somebody back there. Yes. W wait till they get you with the microphone. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, to the three of you, first of all, grateful, grateful, grateful. Talk a moment about tritones and what <laughs> we might hear tonight. Tritones. <laughs> um, yeah, we love like tritones. Maria, that's a tritone. Or, or the anagram of that are the first three notes of uh, West Side Story. Ba -da -dum, which all possibly came from the shofar blown on Yom Kippur. Right. I think that's what that is. Uh, anything else you'd like to know about the tritone? <laughs> well, about, about tonight's program, um, how many sure are there? there? There's going to be a few dozen tritones in there, I'm sure. Um, I just want to say one thing about atonal music, though. We we said earlier that a quiet place, that whole first act is, which you won't hear tonight, but it's s in a funeral parlor, twelve tone music. So Bernstein told me a few times, he says, I can, I can write really good 12-tone music. I can. <laughs> he says, look at what I've done. So I like it to uh, portray and to evoke death. I think it's very effective for that. It's very, also very good for boredom. <laughs> In Candide, there's yeah. a tone row. It's quiet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then the guy goes, quiet. Right. And no one's made a peep, so because they're bored out of their minds. It's no one's sitting there doing anything. It's hot, and so he uses twelve tone music. The other one is insomnia, which he was an expert at. Yeah. So there's a in quiet place. Sam is saying, "I wish I could sleep. Oh, I wish I could sleep." He can't sleep, and there's this tone row going underneath him, and it's like driving him crazy. Cool. Um. I'll add, I'll add two small pieces to things you've, you've mentioned. Um, I don't know if Mark's aware, but I, about seven or eight years ago when John Adams was here at the library, um, it was a noontime session, and one of your colleagues you know, got that letter out, presented it to him, and he was properly contrite. <laughs> so, proper, properly contrite. He was, but it kind of, you know, they kind of made him face it. Um, it was funny. Um, and speaking of atonal or 12-tone music, um, I shared this actually last night at a post-concert Q&A at the National Symphony where they did the Baird Violin Concerto. Um, I heard your father give a brilliant analysis of that piece at Harvard in 1973. I mean, he unlocked the whole piece for me. So he, he, could, he really could do everything. <laughs> um, it was one of the few 12-tone pieces he really loved and performed and recorded.
any brave souls out there? Yes. Wait, 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 wait. Um, I would love to know your um, father's uh, favorite composition of his own and perhaps his favorite composer or composition by someone else. Oh. Uh, well, he was often asked that question and he would always say that it would, it, that, you know, they're, they're my children and I don't have any favorites. And whenever my brother and sister and I are, are recounting this, Nina says, but of course I was the favorite. <laughs> <laughs> Cracks us up. Um, um, I think that he had a very special place in his heart, though, for mass, because he put more of himself into mass than he did in just about any other piece. It's so multifarious, just like he was, and it has so many different flavors and ingredients, just like him. So uh, I, I think it has more authenticity, in a way, than and any other piece he wrote, and, and as a result, I think he had a very special relationship to it, and, and that was why when it finally premiered and was met with mixed reviews, it, it really stung him, because he was very vulnerable over that piece. Um, I'm told that we're, our time is sort of at an end. Um, two things, uh, well, in, have a wonderful time at the concert, I know you will. There is a display of some of the treasures from the Bernstein Collection in the Coolidge Lobby you might enjoy. And tomorrow, in the building across the street, we're doing a whole day of Bernstein-related events, talks, there'll be a huge display there, um, uh, some performances, some things you've never heard before. Um, so I hope many of you can join us. I think it's from 11 to 5, and you can pop in and out however you please. Um, and thank you for coming. That's all. <laughs>